Good to see all you neurohackers out there. Welcome to Tech for Psych, where we combine the latest in neurotechnology with ancient wisdom to supercharge your brain. I'm Dr. Cody Rawl, your medical doctor, confidant, and scientific advisor. Today, we sat down with Dr. Daniel Chow, co-founder of Halo Neuroscience. They have a new device coming out this week called Halo Sport 2 that is really awesome to take a look at. It's a pair of headphones that uses direct electrical stimulation on the motor cortex to help you be stronger, run faster, even learn a skill like guitar quicker. And it was just so awesome to sit down with him, talk about the neuroscience behind the product, their evolution as a company, and even take a look at new endeavors they've thought up in terms of even using direct electrical stimulation to improve meditative sessions. So I really hope you guys enjoy the interview. Stick around. Dr. Daniel Chow, thanks so much for sitting down with me. We're here at Halo Neuroscience. Yes. Thanks for hosting us. It's so cool to be here in San Francisco and see your guys' culture and talk about neuroscience. It's really exciting. Yeah, well, it's awesome to have you. Like, thanks for making the trip out here. Yeah, I was hoping you could tell us about your background as a neuroscientist and how uh, Halo Sport came to be, Halo Neuroscience. What's the story behind this awesome place? Oh, yeah, where, where should I start? Um, so we founded the company, my co-founder, uh, Brett Wingeyer. Uh, he's a PhD in biomedical engineering um, with an emphasis in neuroscience, specifically looking at EEG, which I think is topical for your, your audience. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so he and I were at another neurostimulation company called Neuropace mm -hmm. for years, longer than we care to admit. <clears throat> so we were both very, very early employees there and were there for about a decade. Um, and I don't know if you've, you've heard of Neuropace, it's more a neurology product than a mm -hmm. psychiatry product, but it's, a, it's an implantable neurostimulator mm -hmm. for the treatment of epilepsy. So it's the first responsive neurostimulator of its kind. So, you know, very proud of that. Uh, we got that FDA approved. And, you know, we'd always thought that, you know, the holy grail for the industry, neurostimulation, bioelectronic medicine for the brain, was to make neurostimulators non-invasive. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of neurostimulators out there doing amazing things like in Parkinson's disease and tremor, uh, spinal cord stimulators for pain, the Neuroprice, Neuropace product for epilepsy. So uh, super gr grateful for those products, but we always had a, like a much bigger vision for what neurostimulation could become. And the only way we thought that could happen is that we have to make it in a wearable. Mm -hmm. like we, um, and uh, you know, just at that time, this is great timing, uh, there was this growing field of neuroscientists looking at non-invasive neurostimulation. In particular, TDCS, the literature was really growing fast and becoming stronger, it's literally by the week. Mm -hmm. uh, we couldn't help but to notice this hockey stick forming. Yeah. And you know, it was a, actually a good time for us to part ways with our last company. And this was 2013. We decided to um, to raise a little bit of money. We raised two million bucks to get mm -hmm. started, and um, hired some very junior scientists, just mm -hmm. fresh out of fresh out of college. Found some office space, mm -hmm. and called it a company. Was the previous company in San Francisco as well? Uh, not in the city, uh -huh. uh, about an hour drive south. Well, you're used to the area and the, the culture here. You've been here, I mean, you went to school at Stanford. You've been here for yeah, years. Yeah, that, I went to college at Berkeley. Uh -huh. So yeah, pretty much my entire adult life has been in the San Francisco Bay Area. Gotcha. And there's such a difference between like an implantable device, right, and like a wearable. Um, I mean, that transition to me seems, you know, within the same field, but so many different uh, things that you guys would have had to invent along the way to actually even conceive of having something in yeah. a headset, right? Yeah, you're exactly right, Cody. I mean, in a lot of ways, it's much easier. The implantable device or no, the, 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 the wearable device? Right. Um, okay. So the implantable device, it, it, you know, listen, we're, we're putting the leads, the, the surgical leads right. are designed to be indwelling in the body for mm -hmm. the rest of the patient's life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you can't imagine like the engineering and the quality c control that goes into a product like that. Mm -hmm. um, the stimulator, I mean, has a battery, a primary cell battery, right? Yeah. That if it leaked, could be deadly to the patient. So I, I mean, there is just, um, when you put something in the body, there's just another level of regulation. Mm -hmm. 
and engineering documentation quality control that we have to consider. Mm -hmm. So having that background, building the hardware for this, that was downhill. Yeah. Much easier, um, which was which was great. Um, the so on the flip side of that, the harder part was. Um, you know, when it's implanted, you don't care what it looks like. Yeah. And you're also dealing with only expert users. So only neurosurgeons handle the product. The patient actually doesn't handle the product. Right. Uh, and, you know, neurosurgeons that we know are amongst the most skilled physicians in the world. Sure. Uh, so we can really lean on them um, to, and draw from their expertise to, to handle the product, like a very expert product. You know, with this, we're shipping to non-neuroscientists, non-physicians. We're shipping, like, you know, most of our customers are athletes. Right. Um, so it's just another level of usability testing and making it easy, like just really thinking through, like, how do we make it look good and make it really, really easy so that the world can do brain stimulation without an instruction manual the size of a neuroscience textbook. Right. You just get in the mail and you put it on and start using it with a... To, uh, with a, a little tutorial in the app, right? Yeah, that's, that is the ideal scenario, that they never have to read the manual. And we've got the Halo Sport, is this, this is the two, right? The Halo Sport. Yeah, this is version two. This is the one that we just started shipping about a month ago. But, um, so we've got the Halo Sport 2 here, and I, I think that would be cool if you could just show us uh, this amazing device. Maybe we can backtrack from there and talk about, you know, I saw your iterations out there in, in the case there where it's just, you know, one version after the other yeah. to come to this fine product at the end, but yeah, if you wouldn't mind showing us the, the new Halo Sport 2 here. Yeah, so the business end of this headset is here. So these, um, we call this the primer strip, yep. but between yourself and your audience, these are, these are electrodes. Mm -hmm. uh, these are specially designed to get through hair comfortably and easily uh, because uh, as a reminder, Halo Sport is a motor cortex neurostimulator. Right. And also as a reminder, um, going back to Neuroanatomy 101, the motor strip, the primary motor mm -hmm. cortex, runs roughly ear to ear right over the top of your head. Yeah. So that anatomy is perfect for a set of headphones in terms of targeting. You know, you put on any set of headphones and this part, the arch, just naturally goes over the motor cortex. How convenient. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I haven't been lucky career-wise very often, but this time I have to admit that that was, that was very fortuitous. So, Was that from, straight from the beginning that you guys thought you probably would go for the motor cortex? No. Um, you know, we were, we were interested in um, a variety of different areas of the brain. Uh, yeah. Um, our first product was really informed by the data. Mm -hmm. uh, the data was strongest in motor cortex at the time. Okay. Um, and you know, for us as a company, it was easy for us to replicate a lot of that data um, yeah. with our own testing. Uh -huh. um, in fact, you know, the first year of our company's history was like we didn't think about product at all. We just thought about the science. Yeah, and that's what's so cool about you guys. You know, you look at your website and you just have you know, uh, article after article, scientific articles, just backing up the science. So I, you know, I noticed that from the very beginning that you guys are very science backed. And Cody, I think like, thank you for saying that. And, you know, I think you and your audience will appreciate this, but despite all the publications out there, mm -hmm. it was important for us to spend a year running their protocols mm -hmm. to see if we can generate their result. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's fine that it's published and peer reviewed, but we all know that not everything out in the literature is the truth. Right. So, you know, for us to really feel comfortable with the science mm -hmm. and to, you know, dedicate our lives to this, this project and our scientific credibility, which, you know, takes a lifetime to build, but a day to lose. Yeah. Uh, we really wanted to verify the science first. So, yeah, so that, uh, um, it, it sounds boring, like replicating other mm -hmm. people's protocols, but we felt like it was an important necessary step. Yeah, and you just have like a very strong base to build the company up from. Correct. From there, yeah. Correct. Yeah, so th that's how we landed on motor cortex. It was really the strength of the data in the published literature and also the ease at which we replicated those protocols, mm -hmm. um, which was really encouraging. Like it really just lent credibility um, to the strength of the science. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, from there, it's like, all right, how do we 
how do we take this box, which you saw out in our hallway? Yeah. Um, maybe in a second I can grab it. But you know, our first prototype was literally this kind of beige looking box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to look at, right. but uh, you know, it worked mm -hmm. and we could do testing with it. And then from there, uh, the question is like, how do we, how do we build, build it into a wrapper that people could just pick it up, download an app, and just start doing motor cortex neurostimulation. Yeah, you can use it in the gym or, you know, before you hit the slope skiing, you know, you guys did a lot of work with the Olympic team, right? With mm -hmm. the, uh, any, any type of environment, it looks like you could th theoretically use for athletic enhancement, right? Yeah, yeah, so that's, uh, I mean, headphones kind of go everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, thanks to Beats and Bose and, you know, companies that have been around for far longer and are far bigger than, than us, they've really, um, you know, they're fashionable, yeah. um, people know how to use them, and for us to piggyback on this form factor mm -hmm. uh, was really powerful. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we felt like, you know, if we're going to sell neurostimulators, uh, most people's first reaction when you mm -hmm. tell them that we're, we, we, we are a company that sells neurostimulators, mm -hmm. uh, they usually take a deep breath, <laughs> take a half step back, yeah. and you, know, you could tell by their body language without even them even saying anything that there's a little fear and trepidation there. Yeah. But then when you show them, like, well, this is what it is. Right. They're like, oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. I can get around that. Mm -hmm. Let me see that. Then they're drawn into it. Yeah. Right. And then you tell them, well, these are the electrodes. They're like, oh, that's not a big deal. Yeah. Okay. I get it. Yeah. And I tried them on uh, the other day when we were here earlier and they're very comfortable. Um, I, I love that it kind of sucks into the bottom of it with the magnet. It's very yeah. easy to take it in and out. And, uh, you know, you wet it up a little bit for the good, you know, reduced bioimpedance, right? Is that the right term for it? For or that's more of an EEG term, right? But at least like for that's, the, like, that's... That's exactly right. Like, uh, so, uh, you know, remember that this is a stimulator, not a sensor. Right. And because we're actually pushing current, mm -hmm. these have to be wet, mm -hmm. just like you said. Um, so uh, these nibs, we call them this foam, uh, you, you could dunk it in regular tap water. It doesn't have to be distilled mm -hmm. or bottled water or anything. You can just uh, like wet it under your tap. Um, and it has to be like that. We can't cheat physics here. Yeah. Because yeah. we're pushing current, there needs to be an ionic solution. Mm -hmm. So we can't get a, people ask us, oh, could they be a dry electrode? Mm -hmm. Well, you can on the sensing side. Mm -hmm. We all know that. But um, when you're on the stimulation side, it's impossible. Mm -hmm. So. And, and I think when people hear about, you know, electrical stimulation, they might get worried about the amount of electrical stimulation, right? But your, your guys' product is such a low uh, amplitude, right, of electrical stimulation? That's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the amount that electrical stimulation that we provide has been informed by the literature. Yeah. So the range is uh, roughly 1.2 to 2.2 milliamps. Yeah which is right in the sweet spot of what folks in the literature have, mm -hmm. as, has identified as safe and effective. Yeah. And it's impossible to go beyond that. Mm -hmm. um, Why is it impossible to go beyond uh, that? There's hardware and software controls within oh. our, our, our heads. Oh, well, I, let, oh, I'll, I'll take, take that back. Nothing's impossible. But the hardware but it will be from doing any more than Hardware that. and software. Gotcha. It'll be extremely difficult. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, and the reason why it's doing that is for priming, right? Would you mind taking us through like what priming is and how this actually, you yeah. know, improves athletic performance? Yeah, so uh, what the neurostimulation does mm -hmm. is it induces a temporary state where the underlying cortical tissue, so in this case it's the motor cortex, but yeah. you know, just to see the thought for later in this conversation, it could be anywhere. Right. Um, so the underlying cortical tissue, if exposed to a certain amount of neurostimulation, mm -hmm. um, will be induced into this hyper excitable state mm -hmm. for about an hour. So 20 minutes of neurostimulation buys about an hour's worth where that cortical tissue is slightly more excitable. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what does that mean? So that means it's easier for those neurons to be triggered to firing an action potential. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? So that means probabilistically, 
Okay, just purely statistically, the likelihood of two neurons firing in synchrony mm -hmm. is increased. Mm. And what does that mean? Right? So when two neurons fire in synchrony, well, we all know this is a magical neuroscience event, right? right. This, is the, this is the foundational event for triggering the formation of new synapses, existing synapses becoming stronger. This is the foundational event for plasticity. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we think of uh, like this, we call this a priming step because we think we're priming the brain to be hyperplastic. Mm -hmm. So let's, uh, uh, let's go back to the motor cortex. So if we stimulate the motor cortex for 20 minutes, yeah. now it's in this hyperplastic state for the next hour. Yeah. What we want our users to then do in that hour's window mm -hmm. is to train the motor cortex. Mm -hmm. Okay, so feed it movement repetitions, mm -hmm. right? Deliberate, thoughtful movement repetitions. So mm -hmm. if you're a basketball player, practice your threes and three-pointers. If you're a violinist, practice your scales and your Paganini. Mm -hmm. um, if you're a surgeon, practice suturing. You know, whatever you need to do, like any kind of movement practice, mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be athletic or, you know, we actually have a very much broader term for what we think is athletic. Um, but any sort of movement based repetitions that you're trying to learn, you're almost begging your brain to encode it into muscle memory. Right. Um, we can make that entire process faster with neurostimulation. That's the one that made the most sense to me when I was looking at, like, thinking about. You know, this has probably been said a trillion times in neuroscience courses, but it's like uh, neurons that fire together wire together, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. you're strengthening those neuronal connections, and it made sense to me. Like I'm a guitar player and thinking about like, um, you know, learning a different song or that uh, type of thing. But what was interesting to me is when I was looking at the literature that actually shows that, um, you know, not only is it these uh, choreographed movements that you can improve, but it's actually like strength or like endurance. So I was trying to wrap my mind around that a little bit, and you know, I, I think probably has to do with the amount of uh, neurons that fire at the same time, right, for strength of that type of thing. That's exactly right, Cody. I mean, strength is, um, one, there's a, there's a skill to strength. Right. Right, yeah. like producing, like even something as simple as, say, a deadlift. Right. right. There's still dozens of different muscle groups that need to mm -hmm. work in perfect coordination. Mm -hmm. So there's a skill to an optimal deadlift. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also a skill to exactly what you said, firing maximally. Mm -hmm. So there's a neurologic basis for strength. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, let me give this one an anecdote. So yeah. let's say we put you on a strength program. Mm -hmm. Let's say it's bench press. And <clears throat> you start off and you're doing okay. And then over the next week or two, you're starting to add weight. Yeah. Another two weeks, starting to add some more weight. Mm -hmm. So you've gotten stronger in these first four weeks. Fantastic, good job. Yeah. But you know, this whole concept of muscle hypertrophy, mm -hmm. you know, that takes a couple of months for you to realize the gains of muscle hypertrophy. Yeah. So in the first four weeks, you're getting stronger, mm -hmm. and it's not because of your muscles. Like, what is going on? Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a neurologic basis for strength. That is you figuring out how to contract your muscles more maximally. Mm -hmm. That is you figuring out how to coordinate all the different muscles that are involved in something as simple as a bench press, right? Mm -hmm. Still several do dozen muscles that are involved. Mm -hmm. um, and orchestrating this, this, you know, th this pattern of movement most maximally so that you can push more weight. Mm -hmm. And, the, um, and then on the endurance side, uh, there was this term that was in the paper, and I'm trying to remember, is supraspinal uh, fatigue, is that where the motor cortex gives out and it's just not yeah. like, you know, yeah. allowing you to ha run the additional last mile in the, in the marathon, is that? Yeah, yeah, so uh, there's uh, another term, central fatigue, uh -huh. it's called, uh, where the brain literally gets tired. <laughs> yeah. uh, so here's another little anecdote for that. Did you know that if you worked out your right arm mm -hmm. really, really hard, um, your left arm is weaker, mm -hmm. right? And it has nothing to do with the muscles, mm -hmm. right? It's 100% central. Mm -hmm. uh, so th the brain could literally be, become tired. Like there's less electrical juice that, can, that flows out mm -hmm. such that you can fire the muscles as maximally as you once could. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a actually famous sports scientist, um, 
uh, Professor Noakes from South Africa that coined this term central fatigue. Uh -huh. And there's, uh, it's somewhat controversial, but it, it's, it's still highly talked about today, even though it's been decades since uh, he came out with this theory. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but yeah, there's... Um, Makes sense to me, you know, people say it's all like half of it psychological or more, right? So it's like your mind gives out before your muscles are even... Yeah, so I, you know, there's, <laughs> you know, one could argue that central fatigue might have been an important adaptive feature for humanity mm -hmm. uh, when we were, you know, two million years ago, mm -hmm. where there was a break that said, stop, right? Right. You're at risk of injuring yourself. Before you get rhabdomyolysis or something like that. <laughs> or, uh, yeah, or even south of that, you're at risk of injury. Mm -hmm. Because if you injure your big toe, for example, it could be devastating. Mm -hmm. Like two million years ago, it could be, yeah. <clears throat> like uh, if you can't keep up with the herd, then um, the chances are you might get just dropped off. And yeah, um, yeah that, that, was, that would not be adaptive. Mm -hmm. um, but these days, especially for elite athletes, um, you could argue that it's too conservative. Our, our natural set point is too conservative. Mm -hmm. Like we have a wrapper of all kinds of support. Yeah. And we should be allowed to push beyond that, especially if it's your livelihood. Mm -hmm. If your whole job is to push beyond that, mm -hmm. then we should think of ways of relieving that break. Mm -hmm. um, so it, Bringing this back to neurostimulation, I don't know if we do anything in regards to central fatigue. Um, there is actually a long line of literature looking at motor cortex mm -hmm. stimulation for pain, mm -hmm. Mm. for the treatment of chronic pain. And there's been, there's probably a couple hundred papers looking at implantable motor cortex neurostimulation. So putting a strip lead over the motor cortex mm -hmm. implanted for those people with medic, like extremely intractable pain syndromes. So they failed all different kinds of oral anal analgesi analgesics, opioids, yeah. even spinal cord stimulation, um, just intractable pain syndromes. The last ditch effort is a motor cortex That's neurostimulation and it's efficacious. Yeah, I mean, that'd be great for now. You know, we got the opioid epidemic going on and yeah. So much. So I don't want to get over my skis because the 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 data looking at non-invasive motor cortex neurostimulation for pain is is early yeah. and not conclusive. But I, you know, it's interesting. I think it deserves more more investigation. Like if we can do it implanted, then the question is, could we do it non-invasively? Yeah. So many different routes you guys could take. Before we get too off track, I wanted to ask you what was the, uh, different with the Halo Sport 2, because you guys made some modifications since uh, Halo Sport 1. Yep. Um, would you mind telling us what's, what's new with this one? Yeah, so the, the electrode design has come a long way. Before it was three electrodes, one, two, three. And we got feedback that it was kind of a pain to juggle three. Mm -hmm. um, if you lose one, it, the whole system yeah. Yeah, doesn't work. Yeah. So. Um, we stitched it into one primer strip instead of three separate primers. Um, so that's a win. The foam is dramatically different. So folks that had Halo Sport 1 will really appreciate this. The old foam just didn't like to get wet. Okay. It's hydrophobic. Yeah. Um, so this foam is hydrophilic. And like you probably saw earlier today, it was super easy to get wet. Yeah. Um, and you might take that for granted. But if you had Halo Sport 1, you wouldn't. Had to keep re-wetting in, I'm sure. Yeah, that, yeah. It would, it would take maybe a minute or two of drenching versus okay. this. It's like seconds yeah. and it's wet. Yeah. So that's great. Um, another, uh, another nice feature, this has nothing, nothing to do with neurostimulation, is the sound. Yep. So we were getting feedback that folks were using our headset as their primary set of headphones. Mm -hmm. So that was, I mean, we thought we were selling neurostimulators yeah. and the sound was just kind of an afterthought. Mm -hmm. But when people were telling us that, we, we, we took note. Uh, so we vastly upgraded the, the uh, audio quality mm -hmm. um, and it's also natively Bluetooth. Mm -hmm. Halo Sport 1, you still needed an audio cable. Mm -hmm. But thanks a lot, iPhone. <laughs> I guess we're ditching the cable now. So now these are, yeah, yeah, yeah. These are Bluetooth, uh, Bluetooth audio. And of course, the function of the, the neurostimulator has always been Bluetooth. 
Yeah, I'm sure if someone's using it for the priming, they're gonna wanna you know keep the headphones around for their exercise afterwards, right? So that's probably yeah, why they wanted the audio. It sounds so obvious now, but yeah. Uh, but yeah, folks can just ditch this part or leave it in, um, and then wear use this as a regular set of uh, as a regular set of headphones. And it's still comfortable if you take out the yeah the yeah. Um, oh, the the last thing I should mention is. Um, uh, version one was seven hundred and fifty dollars. Mm -hmm. Version two was four hundred. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean that's some of the benefits of volume. Mm -hmm. um, it's a better product, but since we're cranking out more volume these days, we can sell it at a lower price. Did you guys originally envision kind of having coaches with you know multiple clients with it at the beginning, and then but now you're kind of transitioning to like every consumer should have this, right? Is that sort of a transition that happened over time? Uh, um, you know, we thought the first version was all about the prosumer. So yeah, coaches and trainers, um, really high-end athletes, mm -hmm. those type of people. Uh, with the lower price point, I mean, now we're going after a set of head, like mm -hmm. quality over the ear Bluetooth headphones are about $400 anyways. Yeah, yeah. And now you get a brain stimulator almost for free yeah. <laughs> if awesome. you want it. Yeah. So with the Halo Sport 2, um, you know, it's one continuous, um, stimulation, but you can actually, through the app, determine different areas to stimulate, which actually stimulates different areas of your body, right? Yeah, that's right. So we can take advantage of our knowledge of the motor homunculus. Yeah. And through the app, without being a neuroscientist, you can just tell us what body part you want to exercise, mm -hmm. that you want to train. Mm -hmm. um, so if it's legs, core, and arms, this is the business end. Right. Um, right at the top, CZ. Yeah. Um, if it's left hand, then it's the contralateral. So if I'm putting on like this, if it's the left hand, then this guy is the business end. Yeah. And if it's the right hand, then this guy is the business end. So, and then we'll adjust these other guys to be the reference electrode. Yeah. And I'll have to show a picture of the homunculus on this video, but actually the motor strip uh, correlates different areas of your body, depending like anatomically where it's at, you know, that's just the way that we're wired up, you know, up into the motor cortex. So yeah. it's so cool that you guys actually utilize that with the app. Yeah. And like one thing that I was surprised at is, um, and like happily surprised is that the topology of the, the, the homunculus of the motor cortex is highly conserved mm -hmm. from individual to individual. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm talking healthy brains. So I'm not talking about folks who have had a stroke or, or brain injury. Or yeah. Yeah. So folks that, um, um, have an uninjured brain, like within millimeters of each other. That's amazing. Yeah, isn't it? So even within millimeter, there's like not as much variability. So you guys got that option. And then um, there's different ways to stimulate uh, through transcranial direct stimulation, right? You could use direct current or alternating current. Can you talk a little bit about that as well? Right, right. So the uh, we've been talking about TDCS, and the mm -hmm. DC is direct current. Mm -hmm. That's what Halo Sport does. Like mm -hmm. off the shelf, you're a customer, you buy it, you open up the app, you have access to a DC waveform. Mm -hmm. um, there are other forms of non-invasive brain stimulation. The other big one is called AC, or so alternating current, TACS. Mm -hmm. uh, our hardware has the capability of doing alternating current. Oh, and for our researchers, our research collaborators, and our quote power users, uh, we will allow them access to AC waveforms through a, a special like uh, um, research only door. Yeah. So that's really cool. You know, we here at Halo are experimenting with AC waveforms. We're we're highly interested. And we're seeing sort of that same early startings of a hockey stick in the world of TACS that we saw in TDCS 15 years ago. Um, so um, really, really cool stuff happening in that field. Um, and, you know, certainly like we're interested in opening up the hardware so that it can do more. Yeah. Why, why would uh, researchers want to use AC versus DC? Is it specific projects or just to simply see how it would prime the brain differently or is yeah, so there's, uh, you know, the idea, and like a lot of this comes out of um, EEG research, is that, you know, the brain uh, communicates with uh, distant, uh, like, you know, these certain brain regions communicate with other brain regions through frequencies. Right. And certain frequencies have been correlated with certain mood states. Right. So it could be like a calmness mm -hmm. 
or deep sleep or focus or like being super activated and uh, you know in a crowded situation for anxious, example like, anxious yeah, yeah. so um, you know now it turns out that if you induce these certain frequencies you can induce that kind of behavior mm -hmm. so the idea that these frequencies could be causative um, you know, I think that's newer research. Like mm -hmm. that, that has been proven more conclusively, more recently than some of the stuff with TDCS. And now researchers are coming around and saying, "Well, could we non-invasively stimulate the brain to induce these frequencies, these rhythms, yeah, to produce behavior states that we want?" Yeah. Right. So yeah, we're we're seeing the early signs of that. It's really exciting. And not only changing the the current types, but also the different areas of the brain that you're stimulating, of course, right? Right. Which, which yeah. brings us to talking about, you know, you guys have focused on the motor strip, but there's so much more that you could do with this technology. 100%. Yeah. Hundred percent. So there's um, we've been talking about the motor strip, but there's been some wonderful research done in other parts of the brain. Mm -hmm. um, in particular, the prefrontal cortex mm -hmm. um, has been an area of focus with, I would say, like re really like leading psychiatrists and cognitive neuroscientists coming together and stimulating that part of the brain to generate some really interesting data. Um, so uh, on the disease side, mm -hmm. targeting the prefrontal cortex has been shown to be a potential drug alternative for depression. Yeah. So there are now at least two very well, well done RCTs that show that um, non-invasive brain stimulation of prefrontal cortex mm -hmm. works as well as an SSRI That's amazing. for frontline treatment of depression. So wouldn't that be awesome if we yeah. had, you know, I'm not saying let's get rid of drugs and the SSRI class of drugs altogether, but wouldn't it be nice to have an alternative? Yeah, and I actually talk about the default mode network quite a bit on my channel. Does this ha kind of have to do with that brain circuitry network? or is it's a It's a popular theory, but... Yeah. Um, I think it's only a theory at this point. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we'll, we'll have to wait and see for more, more data to come out. And the other thing that comes to mind for me is like, if you're stimulating the frontal lobe, um, obviously the frontal lobe has so much to do with, uh, like our executive control, but also people talk about like hypofrontality for meditation, that type of thing as well. Do you have any thoughts about like how you could induce hypofrontality in someone for meditation? Or is that something that you could actually do with the electrical stimulation? Do you think? Yes, there's, you know, there's a, there's a rhythm to hypofrontality. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the question is, is like, we can get ourselves into this rhythm mm -hmm. and we feel this state, this meditative state. Mm -hmm. um, and we can do this organically with a lot of training and biofeedback with different consumer products out there or fancier scientific products. Um, now, could you get into that state quicker or deeper if you supplement that rhythm externally. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's some data, this is kind of hot off the press, so, mm -hmm. and there's only a few studies out there, so I don't want to get over my skis again. Yeah. But there's some data that suggests that you can do that, that um, which is really cool. Any other ideas on, you know, how else we could use electrical stimulation to affect the brain? Like what other areas you're interested in? Uh, yeah, so attention and focus, right. uh, I think is, I mean, we need it more than ever because mm -hmm. we're competing against our phone yeah. and we're just getting notified to death. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like productivity of humanity has gone down because, because of our phone. And the counterweight to that is more attention and focus and like more, like the more disciplined we can be about. And I wanted to, maybe it's uh, too much to talk about today, but like as a CEO, like how do you like, cause there's all these different directions you can go with the company, right? Um, and you're looking at simulating different areas of the brain. How do you even like put out, do you just put out feelers and see like what literature is out there and like try to figure out what direction? Mm, no, we, uh, we, so we have seven neuroscientists on staff right. and we have one person. So it's rotating every week, read all the literature that came out in our field, wow. broadly defined over that week. Wow. And you don't have to read every like cover to cover every article, but yeah. at least title an abstract uh -huh. of everything that comes up on our search. Uh -huh. And then pick a few for our digest. Uh -huh. And then pick one, maybe two, 
to cover in depth in a journal club. Remember journal yeah, club? Yeah. So we still do that here. Nice. Uh, so yeah, we like, you know, the, the, the foundation of the company is the science. So you just keep track of what has the most data and evidence and like try to determine which way to steer the company from there. Yeah, we have this massive library and like the library is great. It's just the repository of all the PDFs that we buy. But um, the more important thing is just like documentation on this massive spreadsheet of where the, where the data was published, who the people are, yeah. what the data was, and we give it a star ranking, one, two, or three. Yeah. And you know, from this, we have basically, we call it a hall of fame of the papers that we really admire. Mm -hmm. um, we try to make friends with the researchers that produce the data yeah. uh, because, you know, the good relationships to, to just have face to face. Yeah, in a lot of ways, we're not competitors at all. I mean, there's like we, we provide equipment. Um, we think we provide really excellent equipment. Sure, it could be used great for consumer applications, but um, you know, we're proud that this is also being used as a research tool. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, you see here, we've got you know three scientific groups that have published articles using Halo Sport as their sign their as their neurostimulator. Yeah. Yeah, I, hopefully, you know, that's where the field's going, right? You have the, the private companies doing the innovation, but also like, you know, the scientific academia backing them up with, you know, using their tools, right? I mean, yeah. So there's, uh, there's some really interesting data looking at attention and focus mm -hmm. that have caught my eye. Um, not just my eye, but, um, you know, the eyes of the whole field. Yeah. Um, again, prefrontal cortex stimulation. But I just feel that there is a need for attention and focus like no other time in human history. And that is thanks to this thing called the mobile phone that yeah. distracts us um, throughout our waking hours, sometimes even when we're sleeping. Right? And it's so unfortunate that so many people are just on stimulants medications these days, right? There's just gotta be a better way to overcome what's been diagnosed as ADHD. And Yes, yeah, so, I mean, that's the extreme form, but I mean, I think all of us are being induced into a state of ADHD because of her phone. Right. It's just impossible to be attentive and focused. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, is there a way that we can, we can non-invasively stimulate the attentional centers mm -hmm. of our brain so that we can have so-called more cognitive control? Like think about the things that we want to think of so that we can be productive. Yeah, and on that note, you, you know, I think you guys are so well known for working with athletes and on the consumer side, but also there's a, a medical side to you guys as well that you're exploring. So I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, there's, uh, you know, I, I'm a medical doctor by training, and my myself and my co-founder were actually medical device people. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, our, our last company was a medical device company, and we actually founded Halo as a medical device company. Yeah. Um, we were going to build a motor cortex neurostimulator mm -hmm. for stroke rehab. Mm -hmm. So half of people who have a stroke have some sort of motor disability and the medicine for that is physical therapy. Right. So what if we can augment physical therapy based repetitions? If you can do that, then you can potentially raise the ceiling of what's possible in terms of their recovery. So there's actually some really nice data Looking at that, we have a couple of clinical trials um, that are ongoing, mm -hmm. motor cortex neurostimulation for stroke rehab that we're really excited about. But, you know, in the meantime, the FDA published a guidance document saying that we still consider this a medical technology, but we will allow industry to sell directly to consumers. Okay. So long as you do not claim that it treats a disease. Okay. And on that day, we said, well, we can start shipping a consumer electronic if we wanted. Yeah. So we started doing that, yeah. Yeah, I know my uh, grandfather had a stroke uh, some years back uh -huh. and you know struggled so hard to regain his strength and he's such a tough guy, you know, just every day getting up and doing yard work and everything. But you know, just to have him be able to get like a, a stimulation for his motor cortex to gain some strength and neuroplasticity back would just be, you know, personally, I think of that and you know, get a tear to my eyes, just the, like the implications yeah, yeah. of that would be so amazing. So how do you come back from the FDA saying something like that and you know, sort of still be looking at being able to deliver that capability to people on the medical side and say, hey, this does actually treat stroke victims. Where, how do you go about that? Yeah, so that's a pretty typical medical device approval pathway. Yeah. Um, so you have to do the, you have to gather clinical data. Mm -hmm. 
engineering data, design data, quality control, testing data, um, ship it off into this giant document yeah. that goes to the FDA for their review. Mm -hmm. So as you know, that takes a long time, yeah. but you know, we're, we're working hard at it. Um, awesome. Yeah, we want to see this device become a proper medical device mm -hmm. one day very soon. And would that primarily, primarily be for the, um, the stroke rehabilitation side or would there be other applications that you guys be interested in submitting for yeah. as well? Absolutely. So there's other indications that we're interested in. We just have to be a little coy here. Sure. Um, but yeah, stroke rehab is something that we've talked about and that you know, we're, we're really excited about. So naturally, you know, people uh, see this device and there's electrical stimulation happening through the scalp and people might be concerned about safety. And if you could just, you know, talk us through, you know, the, the barriers protecting people from, you know, actually uh, having any harm come to them would be helpful as well. Yeah, so there's, um, safety is a big topic here at the company. Um, you know, for us, uh, any conversation around safety is a conversation around data. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the medical literature, published later, literature, there's about 4,000 papers published using this technology, mm -hmm. all pointing towards a, like a very safe device. Mm -hmm. Like um, any side effects are extremely mild and self-limiting, mm -hmm. like uh, within minutes. Uh, we get like just like a headache or, or what's yeah. the... So Cody, like headache, mm -hmm. but headache in our experience is occurs at the same rate in the sham group right and headache actually might just be scalp pain uh -huh. so I don't know if it's a true headache um, and in every case uh, it's been self-limiting within minutes yeah and I put the device on myself and you know got some priming I could barely even feel I can even tell if it was actually just the cold water on the electrodes or yeah like the actual stimulation so it, yeah, it's sometimes hard to dissect like which sensation is which sensation, mm -hmm. if it's scalp pain or a headache. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so that's reassuring. Um, some of the papers and um, that have been published have had folks that have been using this technology for uh, a couple of years, mm -hmm. and there's no additional risk as far as the data reports. Um, we ourselves have maybe the world's largest single database in mm -hmm. terms of neurostimulation usage and we've been shipping products for over three years now um, some of our oldest customers have been using it for our technology consistently for over three years and in our experience from our community of people like our data confirms that of the published literature so you know I think everything points towards a really safe mm -hmm. effective device um, um, but I, I appreciate that you asked that yeah and you guys are always reviewing the literature. You know, you were telling me before you literally task a neuroscience every week, a neuroscientist every week to review every paper that's been published in the field and have your your weekly journal club, right? So, I just thought that was really impressive that you guys are just you know so scientifically based. Can you talk a little bit about that, how that works, and how that is ingrained into the culture of the company? Yes, the, the science is our foundation. Uh, without it, we um, we ring hollow. The whole company rings hollow, and that's mm -hmm. not what we do. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so yeah, anything like we build products around the science, mm -hmm. not the reverse. So, uh, you know, for us, it's about uh, staying on top of the literature mm -hmm. um, in this highly systematic way, becoming collaborators with the top researchers, us ourselves doing our own research mm -hmm. to verify what's published, but also to help advance the mm -hmm. field of what we know. So like all of that needs to come together uh, for us to build a company. Like, mm -hmm. you know, the technology is the science. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't wait to see what you guys come up with next. And I'm Thanks. really excited to be using uh, the Halo Sport myself to help, you know, maybe boost my uh, bench press a little bit or my <laughs> train for a marathon here. So, or play the guitar. There's so many different applications. So I really appreciate you having me Thanks, here. Cody. It's just been awesome to meet you guys and be here in the office. So really appreciate it. Appreciate you. Thanks for coming out.